Thank you for being here. Since uh, our colleague uh, Dr. Baker is not present yet, I would like to welcome Dr. Lyubomir Litvinchuk. May we have his presentation? Dr. Litvinchuk will uh, explain us uh, the new tools for RD surgery. Good morning to everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for the uh, brilliant meeting and for inviting me here to Barcelona. And today I'm going to talk about uh, scleral buckling and how can we save this technique in our modern times of vitreoretinal surgery. These are my financial disclosures and I'm co-inventor of the instrument that I will present. And in our days, the uh, the, the rate of the buckling surgery decreased already. In some countries, in some clinics, with the uh, old school of the retinal detachment surgery, you will see those, um, those surgeries. But, uh, for example, in our clinic, uh, we have this m m possibility. And uh, in some clinic where they do more Vitrectomies, the residents have, have no chance to be involved in this old type of the surgery. So how can we merge, how can we uh, combine both approaches, the old one and the new one, and can it be beneficial? Recently there were many talks and um, papers published about the uh, endo elimination assisted scleral buckling. And you know this technique that instead of a binocular ophthalmoscope, in order to visualize the inner of the eye, we use a chandelier light and we, we use biome. And it decreases the uh, time of the surgery. I would say it will, it will give you the better view. Uh, and uh, yeah, additionally, uh, additionally, you have to use the additional instrument, the chandelier, which will a little bit increase the cost of the surgery and biome. And this is the example of such a surgery performed by Professor Binder. And the muscles are fixed. You introduce the chandelier. And here you see intraoperative OCT. And the macula is off. And with biome, we can indent 360 and find a break. And uh, exp uh, examine uh, the attached retina uh, and looking for the breaks. And be sure that this, the, the breaks we uh, localized are the only breaks and the only minimal sclerobuckling will be needed. Then we make a cryo. And we can control and see the cryo applicates. And this is again one, one of the cryo. And then we can suture the uh, band or the, the scleral buckle, very minimal, only in, in the certain place where we need to, to, to suture this. And the surgery is done. And uh, sure, you, you, you have to close the small sclerotomy from the chandelier. D during this surgery, and we like this surgery, and if you will try this surgery for a scleral buckling, you will like it too, because it's, it's more convenient to do this. And uh, there is a small or a big inconvenience, I think, in order to mark and to depress and to mark, you have to do additional manipulation. You have to indent, you have to move out the biome, you have to mark, then you have to check, move biome again. You have to recheck. So there are a few additional manipulates. And uh, there, are, uh, scleral buckle, there are scleral markers that can produce some uh, marking 
place uh, marking a point, but at the same time of scleral indentation. So if you are indenting in the correct uh, place, you will get a correct mark. But if you are indenting in not correct, you will get an incorrect uh, point, uh, marking point. And it means that you, at the end of the marking, you will have a bunch of marks and you will see which one is correct, which one is not. So that's why we invented a new instrument. And this is in indenter marker. And the main uh, purpose of this instrument is to indent and to mark only in a certain t time of point. The same session, but only when you need it, not always. So, and there are two prototypes. One prototype is just indenter marker, and the second prototype, on your right, this is the indenter marker with the introduction of uh, chandelier. And this is how it looks with a chandelier. We used uh, uh, Oshima a dual port light, 27 gauge, and you can, uh, this uh, instrument is compatible with 23, 25, 27, 29 gauge chandeliers. And the, the dual uh, port is very uh, nice to, um, uh, to, main, to, to use because one of them you use for the enlightenment of the inner of the retina and the other for the uh, sh seeing your indenter. So you can increase and you can decrease the light and you can uh, set the light as you wish. And uh, if it is too shiny, you can decrease it on the photon. In, in this case, this is photon light source. Uh, and how can we st uh, get a uh, mark from this? And take, take a look on the staining of the. We stain the instrument, tip of the instrument with a sterile uh, s uh, uh, skin marker. And this is how it looks. There are two tubes. One tube is for the chandelier, and another tube is for a small tip which can go out and in. And if it is out, it makes no stain. But if it is, if it is in, when it is out, it can make up to 10 stains in one session. So it it can even uh, paint a line on the sclera if you need it. So you can just paint the sclera around your break. So only, and you see it, it paints only when you squeeze the handles of the um, instrument. So if it, the handles are not squeezed, it, it, is, it, it does only in the indentation. What is it? This. Okay, this is schematic view, how do you use it? So there's the biome lens and the chandelier um, enlights the inner, but from outer, from the eye, you have another chandelier in introducing the instrument. And you see when we are indenting from inside with the other instruments, we see always a buckle, but we don't see the very highest point of the buckle. So, and we suspect that this point is the uh, highest point and we mark then on the sclera. But with this instrument, you see precisely the light point of the highest top of the, uh, of the hill inside the eye. So, with your marking, you will be much more precise with this light. And then, in a certain point of time, you just squeeze the handle and you get a nice sharp mark on the sclera. So this is how it looks inside the eye, the point, and this is how it looks uh, outside the eye, the marking point. And this marking point, the, the tip of the instrument um, is made so that you actually make a small tattoo on the sclera. So you cannot wash it, this mark, very easily as, as it is uh, with the conven conventional um, marking. Uh, and. Uh, you are not damaging the sclera if it, if it is uh, well, uh, as um, using a cautery. So this instrument was patented and it, it got already a European patent and it, it calls light guided sclera depressor marker Litvinchuk and Binder. And this is how it works during the surgery. The most, the, the other important thing is that uh, during indentation with a light you don't need a uh, indent too much and indentation force means the pain for the uh, patient 
and it means that, that the eye has to be very good anesthetized. And uh, this is usually a general anesthesia or retrobulbar block. But with this indenter, we use a minimal indentation force. That's why you will see in this surgery, I use only subtenon block. This is sclerobuckling only with a subtenon block. So you see the opening of the conjunctiva. The subtenon block, I usually do this in two quadrants, upper and inner. So I introduced 27 Gerge uh, Oshima dual port. And this is uh, view from the outside. I uh, handle the um, instrument with another light. And I start to indent with a depressor. And, uh, and you see the point of the indentation. Unfortunately, and this is a squeezing moment when you want to put a mark. And the mark is very distinct and you can use a minimal buckle only in this place where you need and the surgery is done. And the patient will not feel uh, uh, much more of the pain. So in this case it was air uh, and the tamponade as well. So what, what are the advantages of the chandelier assisted sclerobuckling? We see the breaks more precisely because we have the bigger magnification. The less indentation forces and the subtenon block can be used and the only local buckles and the less surgical time and the quick learning curve. And the, the new, the new, new um, young residents will learn this technique. And these advantages, these are sclerotomy, which theoretically brings the risk for uh, inflammation, but this sclerotomy is 27 on, or even 29 gauge. This is like intravitreal injection and additional instruments. So the advantage using the, our instrument, it will be a precise localization of the retinal break on the sclera because you see the an, a light point in the, inside the eye and the very top point of the hill. The, you don't need to displace microscope and biome during marking and during um, rechecking the point of the indentation. And you can simultaneously ident and mark only when you need it. And you use less, uh, more or less indentational forces. And uh, sure, you have to buy this instrument, but it costs the additional cost. Uh, to summarize, these are my acknowledgments. To summarize, I would like to say that the Sclerobuckling technique uh, has a take has a major um, it's a major uh, treatment modalities in local retinal detachment and I would not leave it on a on a margin uh, and I would uh, uh, ask you to support this technique and to teach the young doctors because uh, for me for us it looks like to learn a FACO FACO without extra capsule or cataract extraction. So this is a good technique and we can attract them new the, the young doctors with a special instruments and special techniques, special improvements of the technique. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we may proceed with discussion immediately because we have time. Uh, I would like to ask you if uh, uh, the split be uh, the beam that you use of the light, is it uh, split? Uh, so the beam from the light, light source. source? Yes. If you use uh, dual chandelier, you mean double lights? Twin lights. No? Twin it's lights. A twin light. This oh. is twin light. So, so there are two major types of chandelier. Mono, mm -hmm. just one light, and, so and practically you use half of the of the um, brightness. You can use very minimal brightness. Uh, actually, during the surgery, you you need to use. Uh, I use a, a dark system, so you can use 50 percent of the light, 40 percent of the light. Thank you very much. This is an excellent tool. I would have imagined that the marking was not so easy because the surgical field is wet. We usually have to dry yeah. and to then try in mark. Order to mark. Yeah, this you is don't not, need it. This is not the case with the instrument. Why? The instrument has a smooth, uh, first of all, it, uh, the size, the, the square, the diameter of the instrument, of the major tip, which makes a mark, is approximately one millimeter. An additional tube for the light has uh, 
0 0.6 millimeters. So this is a, like eight, uh, two tubes. So, and the surface of these tubes are very good polished, so they are not sharp. And they cannot induce the perforation, perforation. anyway. Mm -hmm. But if even you in uh, thin scleras like even myopes. in myopic eyes, so you because the force of the indentation is much Minimum. much less than. So we use more the light than we use uh, more the, light. the mechanical yes. change. Yes, you okay. can use you can use just a light to see where you are and to see where is your break and to see where you have to uh, suture the buckle. And uh, the other thing, when you are approaching uh, the tip, the tip to the eye, you do a slight imp uh, depression, and during this depression, the wet, the moisture, go out, goes out. But as I told, the the instrument's tip designed so that you are making a small tattoo, tattoo. so it doesn't matter if it wet or okay. if it dry. Because it's it tattoo goes inside, inside the, the tissue. episclera tissue okay. and not forever. And but I long will, enough to yes, but make the suture. Yes, and I w will not recommend to use this instrument to, to do a normal tattoo. But <laughs> <laughs> you have always been a tool guy. This is a very important tool also because you compare scleral buckling to... Um, ECCE compared to FACO, but uh, I think it's even more than that because there are cases that cannot be completed uh, with you, you uh, mean with surgery. the intracapsular, with the intracapsular cryo yeah. <laughs> or structure. extra or extra capsular. There are cases that really cannot be done with other means like yes. um, children uh, yes. insertion, uh, macular buckling. So it. It is very important, and as long as we can see, we can do. The, this new way to perform episcleral surgery is safer because we can see better. And since I started two years ago, I think I've never changed. I've never went back to the indirect ophthalmoscope. But the problems that I encounter are, when I started, I started with a 25G chandelier. So the hole was Big, big, yes. big enough to have a vitreous incarceration when I remove the chandelier. Then you need, need and, uh, to do some now cutting. Now I'm using the 29, it's better, still you may have, but it's comparable to an injection, as you yes. said. The other point is that when you have the chandelier inside, you cannot turn so much the eye in order to place the suture, place the buckle. When you turn it, the chandelier may touch the lens mm or the retina. And if you remove it, you may have vitreous incarceration. So I think this is the weakest point of this surgery. Uh, I do agree. And uh, actually with the new instrument, during the localization, you don't need to much to rotate the eye. Mm -hmm. you just, don't just to need. suture the... Yes. During the, the suturing, maybe yes. But uh, yes, but if you are using Oshima, mm -hmm. and uh, Oshima is a, so designed that it, it has its own port. Mm -hmm. So, and it's much more safer. I, I would recommend, yes, but Oshima you can combine, I think, only with Photon from Synergetic. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and Oshima has as well a 29 gauge. It has. And um, I think this is, with a small port, it's safer. Thank you but so much. Thank you for, thank very you. much. I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Lyubos Nauer from Croatia. He will uh, speak about pneumatic retinopexy re-evaluated. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today. I will talk, um, let's start with the presentation. Okay. So. Uh, I would like to talk about another technique uh, for resolving retina detachment. Um, so as we know, uh, pneumatic retinopexy is uh, mostly popular in uh, uh, United States and Canada, while in European countries it's um, mostly a neglected uh, technique. 
So we see that uh, it's mostly used in uh, United, uh, United Kingdom and uh, in German-speaking uh, uh, countries, uh, only 5% of uh, vitreo retinal surgeons use this technique. For what regards uh, our uh, experience with the pneumatic retinopexy, uh, you can notice that uh, since uh, 2012 until 2014, uh, the number of pneumatic retinopexies at our department uh, increased steadily. And now, since uh, 2014 till now, uh, the number is uh, practically steady. So I would like to share with you the results of uh, 97 patients that we treated in the last three years with pneumatic retinopexy. Their mean age was about 60 years. Uh, we consider as eligible for pneumatic retinopexy uh, people who have uh, retinal detachments with a single or multiple contiguous breaks, which are positioned between 9 and 3 o'clock. And uh, the very important prerequisite is uh, that uh, they have a clear optical medium and that uh, warrants uh, the good fundoscopic exam. We do not treat uh, people with the lattice degeneration which are too far away from uh, original uh, retinal breaks which cause the retinal detachments. We do not treat also, uh, obviously, the people with the uh, PVR, uh, grade C or D. Or uh, if we uh, judge that the patient uh, is not going to be able to maintain post-operative head position. So here are some uh, data about the uh, people who were treated. Uh, we had uh, more male and female patients. Uh, uh, what is very uh, important here is that 79% uh, were phakic, while only 21% were pseudophakic or aphakic. Then we have some data about uh, how many quadrants were detached. Uh, only 11% uh, of patients had uh, vit some vitreous hemorrhages. 43% uh, uh, had macula off de detachment and 8% uh, had uh, multiple contiguous uh, retinal breaks. So for what regards the technique, uh, we use uh, local anesthesia, retrobulbal injection of uh, lidocaine. Uh, then we uh, proceed with the light uh, cryo uh, under the indirect uh, ophthalmoscopy. Then we prepare and treat the surface of the eye with 10% betadine, and we uh, perform the uh, translimbal uh, paracentesis with the plunderless uh, syringe equipped with the 30 gauge needle in order to lower the IOP. Then we inject the pure uh, half milliliter of SF6, and we check immediately the perfusion of the central retinal artery. After the application of the local antibiotics, we instruct the patient uh, how she, he should uh, maintain the position. And uh, we uh, tell them to maintain, to intend to maintain that uh, position for at least six hours in continuation after the surgery, and then as much as they can. Here we have one uh, case of a uh, bullous retinal detachment with uh, two contiguous retinal breaks, which are here. Uh, the visual acuity was uh, really poor because of the macula off uh, retinal detachment. And uh, on the right side, we see uh, the situation six months post-operatively, where the visual acuity was only 0 0.3. The retina was completely attached, but the poor visual acuity is uh, probably caused by uh, the foveal atrophy. Uh, the mean follow-up time was uh, of 14.2 months, minimum six months. And uh, we see on this graph that uh, both macula on and off, uh, especially macula off uh, retina detachments had an increase of uh, uh, visual acuity after surgery. For what regards the complications, uh, we had 12% uh, of uh, patients which had uh, a rise in uh, intraocular pressure, which was dealt only by 
local treatment. Six eyes had uh, new or uh, preoperatively missed breaks. Uh, three eyes uh, developed PVR and six eyes uh, delayed subretinal fluid absorption. So the single operation success rate uh, in, in these 97 uh, patients was uh, of 80.4% and final success of uh, 98%, which is, as we see, in, uh, in the range of uh, previously reported uh, success rates of uh, pneumatic retinopexy. So uh, 19 eyes did not, uh, they failed in uh, reattaching uh, the retina after pneumatic retinopexy. And when we controlled various um, factors that can uh, influence uh, the rate of uh, retina reattachment, we found that a number of retinal breaks, uh, the existence of partial hemophthalmos and the number of quadrants which were detached did not influence at all uh, the, um, uh, the success rates of pneumatic retinopexy. Although, uh, when we controlled the cataract or the lens status, uh, there was a, a statistically very significant difference in success rates between uh, the group of patients who had their cataract operated previously to retina detachment in comparison to the patients who did not, uh, who had their, uh, their natural lens in place. So that means that uh, people who have uh, their, uh, who are pseudophagic have 1.43 times higher uh, the chance of uh, failure of uh, pneumatic retinopexy. So here we, we have one uh, case uh, where the primary operation has failed. And uh, as you can notice from the uh, right side uh, picture of the anterior segment, uh, that uh, this was a traumatized uh, eye. Uh, and, uh, and this patient was, uh, had his uh, cataract operated. And after a few years, he developed uh, the uh, retina, uh, superior retinal detachment. And uh, six months postoperatively after the pneumatic retinopexy, uh, he developed uh, the inferior uh, retinal detachment. And uh, during the vitrectomy, uh, obviously, there was a lattice degeneration which was uh, overseen before pneumatic retinopexy because of the state of the pure dilation of the pupil. And uh, for what regards the retinal tear positions, we, here in this um, diagram, we see uh, the success rates for every quadrant that we treated. And we saw that uh, there was no statistical difference uh, among uh, those uh, positions. But uh, we can notice that uh, there are two positions of the retinal tears which had the lower uh, success rates, and that is on 10 and 2 o'clock positions. Uh, when we uh, compare and combine the success rates of uh, uh, the, uh, of the retinal breaks which were positioned at 10 and 2 o'clock and compare them to the rest of clock hours that we treated, there was a statistically dif uh, important difference. So that means that uh, patients who have uh, the retinal tears at 10 and 2 o'clock positions have 1.72 uh, times uh, higher risk of uh, uh, failure uh, after the pneumatic retinopexy. So we can conclude that uh, the pneumatic retinopexy is still a valid alternative to other retinal detachment surgery techniques. Uh, we can see from this uh, diagram that uh, the greatest success rates we can expect from uh, uh, retinal tears which are positioned in a green area, somewhat lower but still very useful. Uh, success rates are at 3 and uh, 9 o'clock positions, in, uh, evidenced in yellow. But we have to be cautious with the retinal tears which are positioned in uh, positions num uh, 10 and 2 o'clock. 
And also we have to bear in mind if the patient is pseudophagic and aphagic. If uh, uh, the reti uh, retina detachment that does not uh, resolve uh, after pneumatic retinopexy, and uh, from my clinical experience, I would say in a 48 hours, if you don't see the retinal detachment resolving, then you should uh, um, not uh, um, delay the rescue operation. And in that way, you actually um, are maintaining uh, and not jeopardizing the success rate of the next uh, operation. And uh, for what regards the cost effectiveness, I think that this is uh, the most cost effective treatment for retinal re detachment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. We have a question. Uh, very excellent results, and uh, I use as well this technique. The so question... you are one of those uh, German-speaking uh, <laughs> surgeons who is uh, among 5%. <laughs> So please tell me uh, regarding the um, methods uh, you wrote. You use antibiotics. What, yeah. do, you, what do you mean? No, it's uh, just a topical, topical antibiotics. But um, you use uh, the syringe, the needle, mm -hmm. to puncture the uh, anterior oh. chamber. Yes. Uh, do you uh, make up towards the infiltration of the orifice or no? No, it's a no. self-sealing. Uh, it's not self-sealing. It's, uh, it's the, the problem. The, this is the very yeah. interesting problem, and we show that with the needles, the needle is round, mm -hmm. and the needle is polished. The end is polished. That's why it is sharp, but it is sharp not not from the outer side, but always from the inner side, uh, inner inner edge, and. Uh, Puncturing with a needle, I do it the same with the needle, mm -hmm. but I'm cautious what I'm doing. Puncturing with the needle, the uh, the corner, we cutting out the very thin slope cylinder of the tissue, mm -hmm. and it is not self-sealing, and it is can, it can be a risk for contamination. But I feel Good that uh, since you, excuse me. No, no, go ahead. Uh, since you inflate the eye, uh, you rise the pressure, so uh, the flow, if you have any floor, uh, it's only outwards, so until it heals. So uh, I feel that there is no backward flow, so uh, while you are uh, in a hypotenuse eye, you are in a sterile situation. And uh, after, after the surgery, I feel that there is uh, not so many um, risk of uh, getting uh, endophthalmitis because of the of the pressure which is which is uh, rather high after the immediately after the surgery thank you but anyhow this is a good point uh, with the needle we just uh, open uh, a door that cannot be completely closed so we should bear it in mind uh, even is this small uh, orifice of you 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 use i, I suppose 30 gauge needle yes, 30, yes. Of, of even 30 gauge opening you can uh, um, uh, you, you can hydrotize. Mm -hmm. You can probably, but you can put the, the place your cannula with the syringe. Water to close it. Yeah, it could be a, a good advice. I actually agree that this is a, one of the surgical techniques that we cannot put aside completely. Sometimes it saves the OR schedule. Absolutely. And it that saves you time. And you have a retinal detachment. You have no time to make a whole scleral buckle or vitrectomy. And uh, it allows a good reabsorption of fluid at least to reschedule the patient maybe two or three days after. So it's another no, way to look at it. That was our... Uh, Your approach. We are the, uh, the department which is uh, serving the um, half a million uh, population normally and during the summer uh, we have even yeah. more. So, scheduling uh, problem, uh, yeah. It's the problem of scheduling. But that the issue is, is that, that was pushing if, us if, uh, if we look at it this way, we have to make sure that we are not jeopardizing, compromising, yeah. jeopardizing. And the, the key point that you highlighted is that the eye has to have no other lattice generation that may induce more break inferiorly and then actually if you are uh, not 100 make it more sure complicated. 
that you have revised completely the retina, mm -hmm. maybe it's better to, uh, to think to of it. another technique. I observe from your initial table that the increasing number of PR were um, comparable to decrease of sclera buckling more than vitrectomy. Yes. Because uh, mostly we uh, perform this kind of technique in uh, now more and more on people who are uh, uh, phakic okay. and ah, they are okay. younger uh -huh. uh, with uh, not uh, old retinal detachments. So that is that, that they is wear, going. They were the sclera buckling the previously yeah. selection. Okay, okay. That is mostly. Um, and you added as an exclusion criteria the. Um, uh, let's say, uh, not clear media, uh, the absence of clear media. Um, I tried to perform this technique with the chandelier light. Mm -hmm. It's not so cost effective at that mm -hmm. point, but uh, you may um, open up new indications because you can see much better what you're doing. That's a good uh, idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to welcome our next colleague, Dr. Falkland Radler. She will explain the pros and cons of 27G vitrectomy. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here at this wonderful meeting in Barcelona. So, I have nothing to disclose for this talk. Um, if we look at the investigations during the last years, small gauge retractomies like 23 gauge or 25 gauge has become very popular because it offers a high anatomic stability and an improvement of visual acuity. However, the reports regarding the refractive error after combined cataract surgery and small gauge retractomy are not so clear because um, some studies have investigated 23 gauge and they reported that um, higher myopic error may occur after surgery. So if you look at this picture, you see that the wounds are getting smaller and smaller and 27 gauge instruments only creates wounds of 0 0.4 millimeters. So uh, we uh, conducted a prospective study and we wanted to find out what about the indications for 27 gauge vitrectomy, how are we doing using these instruments and what are the patient's outcomes. We included um, vitreo retinal disorders like apiretinal membranes, macular holes, esterate hyalysis, vitreous hemorrhage, vitreous macular traction, and if the patient had signs of cataract, we also did an additional cataract surgery. What were our outcome measures? We wanted to know what are the surgical conditions, what about the complication rates, the IOP and the patient's comfort or discomfort, and of course the patient's outcomes. The anatomic outcome we assessed was OCT, functional outcomes, and in our combined cases, we also wanted to know what about the refraction after surgery. So that's a small video. It's a patient operated with a 27 gauge Alcon. I like to use this plate because it stabilized the eyeball, but you also can use a scissor. And this patient also had cataract. So you see I did the cataract surgery and uh, then I hydrate, hydrate the main incision. Then um, core vitrectomy is performed and this patient had an e in a membrane. You see it on the right scan. It's an intraoperative OCT showing the membrane. And I also like to do um, look, to have a look at the periphery. In these cases, just that I don't miss any tears. For the staining, I use um, membrane blue dual, then I switch to the flat lens, and here you can see the, uh, the peeling of the membrane with the end gripping ILM forceps. And I wasn't sure if I got everything, so I did a restaining, and then I removed the rest of the membrane. 
And um, now you can see the OCT, there's just a small dimple, but it's not in the center, so I didn't remove it. So these are the results of our first 65 patients having a follow-up of six months. We included 10 macular hosts. The majority of cases were epiretinal membranes, followed by 40 cases with asteroid hyalosis. Two patients had vitreous hemorrhage and two other patients vitreous macular traction. The majority of patients also had cataract and we did a combined surgery. So um, if you look at the time for surgery, the time for vitrectomy is slightly increased, but the um, wound architecture after surgery is really nice, so the overall surgical time is the same compared to other small gauge systems. What about the efficacy? You can also use 27 gauge um, devices for dense vitreous hemorrhages or dense cellular infiltration of the vitreous or very uh, sticky vitreous which is attached to the posterior pole. So this was a patient having um, hemorrhages cause of retinal tears. You see here I'm indenting the periphery and shaving the vitreous at the periphery and there is one tear and, and uh, some others are there. And this is the endolaser coagulation. So it's a nice curved tip and you can easily do the laser coagulation. And if you don't have enough access, you even can switch your hands. And this patient get an air feel at the end of surgery. This is another patient so um, again the plate and this is the dog system so it's another device which offers 27 gauge and there is one difference here you have a plug you have to remove before you can connect the infusion cannula and this offers you a very large volume and very stable IOP during surgery. This patient had a very sticky vitreous and I used membrane blue dual before peeling just to see how the attachment is going on and here you can see that it's easily to detach the vitreous. And the next video is just um, to show you that you also can use the, the scissors and you can mark it with the uh, part of the posterior part of the sclerotomy device because the instruments are very sharp. So um, we have two main systems available for 27 gauge Alcon and uh, drug. And um, it may be that you think that the instruments are a little bit more flexible. You notice uh, this especially in left eyes or in very small or hyperopic eyes. And um, there may be some difficulties at the beginning if you do an ILM peel but I really like the forceps. It's very tiny and precise, and you can grasp, grasp the retina and create a tear, so the ILM peeling doesn't make any problems. So if you are used to uh, use a tennis scraper, like you can have for 25 gauge or 23 gauge, there's an alternative flex loop from Grease Harbor, so it's working like a tennis scraper. This is um, another picture. You see this is the intraoperative OCT. This patient had a macular hole and you see after staining the membrane with membrane blue dual, I do the ILM peeling and I just leave it connected to the edges of the hole. And then I use the retractor and cut the flap that it's not too large. And then you can use the retractor or any other device to put it inside the hole. You can see it here. And the OCT is very nice because you see how are, is your flap placed and do you have to change anything. And after surgery, I give the, these patients an air bubble and I ask them to, to position for about three to five days for some hours. 
So um, if you look at the wound, um, we had no case with wound leakage. All patients had a stable IOP, they had minimal postoperative inflammation, and they also reported that they had less pain. We had only one complication, just a mild vitreous hemorrhage after surgery, which spontaneously resolved during follow-up. And the outcome also was very good. The OCT scans showed good anatomic results. We had a significant improvement in all cases from baseline 0.50 LOCMAR to 0.1 LOCMAR at the last follow-up exam. And uh, looking for the refractive error, there were also a low refractive error in our combined cases, so the mean final IOL power prediction error was 0.23 diopters, and the mean final astigmatism was 0.8 diopters. So um, if you see the results, for me, um, the advantages are more important than the small disadvantages, you have an ex excellent wound architecture, you have less postoperative inflammation, and you have promising functional anatomic and refractive results. And that's the reason why I do my easy or easier cases like apiretina membranes, holes, traction, floaters, esterotylysis or hemorrhages with 27 gauge. It's also um, nice to use it for biopsies because um, the wounds are very tiny and if you do it in a block, you don't create uh, a lot of pain for the patient. You can see here that the port is larger compared to the other systems and it's closer to the cutter tip. So it's a nice um, device also as a dissection instrument instrument for membrane segmentation or delimination, as you have in diabetic cases. So if you use a channel yield light, you can also use the vitrector for the separation of the membranes, like a scissor. It's also an indication for uh, surgery for babies with ROP. And, um, Recently, Stanislaw Rizzo reported his first experience using 27 gauge for regmatogenous retina detachment, and he found that um, there are no disadvantages compared to 25 gauge. And uh, if you have a patient, for example, with a severe diabetic retinopathy and you want to give him a silicon oil, you can also do combinations of different gauge systems, so you can use 23 gauge if you want to put in a 5,000 centi stoke silicon oil for the infusion port, and you use 27 gauge or 25 for the other ports. Thank you so much. Are there questions from the colleagues? As far as cost effectiveness, would you recommend to have the 27G, even in an OR, we already have 25 or 23 because you have to buy the whole new setup of instruments. That's a good point. So um, I know that you can um, get some of the uh, sclerotomy ports uh, separately so you don't have to buy everything. So mm -hmm. for me, I tried to use 25 gauge for detachments and so on, and for easier cases, 27 gauge. So 23 gauge has become less interest, uh, interesting for our cases. So maybe you can switch. Mm -hmm. This is the yeah. trend. Yeah. You listed also asteroid dialysis. Mm -hmm. It seems easy, but in the asteroid dialysis, the attachment of the vitreous is extremely yeah. strong. So that means that there are no problems at all in inducing enough suction um, to be able to detach the vitreous in any case. So I had one case, um, and then I had to switch to the flat lens and to try and size to... the yes, with the, 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 yes. the membrane, the yeah. limiting membrane, yeah. the inner limiting membrane. Okay. But the suction is fine, and normally you don't have to switch. Have you tried a diabetic patient? Because I've I have tried, tried, and I think the advantage of using one tool as scissors and forceps is good. Mm -hmm. However, uh, 
not every case is, can be done with that, especially when the membrane is so flat that uh, it is not possible to find the edge. Yeah. And the surgery is actually longer as you pointed. That's right. But so it's hard, but sometimes if you just go in with the retractor, you can, um, it's, it's not sharp, so you can really split it a little bit. And we have the the intraoperative OCT, so you can also see what is this. Is this a uh, retina or is this the membrane? So you can collect all these devices and it helps mm -hmm. you a lot. How many of you use 27G? Raise your hand. Still few, so it's good to talk about it and share experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. And at this point, I introduce myself. <laughs> I will uh, present you the preliminary result of autologous transplantation of retina and choroid. Last year, uh, I heard this talk. Our colleague, Dr. Tamer Mahmoud, presented his first case of autologous transplantation of a patch of retina to treat a myopic, chronic, very large, pluri-operated macular hole. Um, he presented encouraging results in terms of anatomical integration of the retinal patch and also functional results. Uh, functional results meaning a gain in vision up to 2050. Uh, I was extremely impressed, as you can imagine, and uh, I decided to apply this technique to some of my patients. Um, this is the first case that I operated, a chronic macular hole. I selected the same indication. Um, this lady had been operated a few times, so she had no ILM left. Um, also, the autologous transplantation of ILM was difficult because the peeling had been done up to the arcade. Um, so I decided to, to apply this technique. And you see the video of the isolation of a retinal patch in this case, in the nasal side, as you can imagine, there's nothing written on the, um, on the subject. So many issues are still open, where to harvest, how large uh, the technique. In this case, I decided to isolate the patch. Uh, I used PFCL and then I moved the, the patch with a tunnel scraper inside the hole. I left some PFCL on top of it and I um, started the uh, PFCL silicon oil direct exchange. During the exchange, as you can see in the video, uh, it was difficult to maintain the patch stable inside the hole. I repeated the technique, uh, the exchange, a couple of times, and then I decided to leave PFCL in order not to lose the patch. So I left the PFCL for one week. Uh, the first comments were that I found difficult to manage the retina flap. Uh, I did diatomy at the edges of the flap before cutting. Probably it was not a good idea because the, the edges are what we need to integrate the patch into the macular hole. Uh, and probably I did not enough diatomy at the harvesting site after isolating the patch and uh, I found a mild bitters hemorrhage for a few days postoperatively. In that case, I decided to leave PFCL and I aspirated PFCL one week after for the difficulties in the completing the uh, PFCL silicon oil exchange. So you can see the, the edges of the patch are very difficult to see. This is still under PFCL. Uh, the first day post-op. 
One week post-op, the OCT actually looks good, and uh, the, the, the edges of the patch are difficult to, um, to differentiate, and it seems to start integrated in the peripheral retina. Um, this is four months post-op. It was difficult to interpret. Uh, you can see that there is this epiretinal fluffy tissue that uh, it was. It looked like a new finding. Still, I noticed no major improvement in vision. Uh, at high magnification, you can see initial cystoid changes in the flap and uh, this new epiretinal tissue. Um, it seemed to me like uh, the patch was not integrating at all. And uh, in fact, two months after, I could see a complete degeneration of the, fl of the flap uh, with atrophic changes, cystoid changes. So it was a complete failure. This was my second case. The indications were very, very similar to the first one. Um, I decided to harvest the patch from the temporal side, um, very close to the posterior pole, thinking that the anatomy of the retina in this area might mm, resemble more the, mm, the, the retina in the fovea, although we have no cones, only rods. Uh, so I detached it with a bubble of air. I uh, isolated the patch mm, not completely, I left a, a small hinge and then I injected PFCL. Under PFCL, I completed uh, the isolation of the patch and then moved the patch in the, in the fovea. Uh, in this case, I still decided to leave PFCL because I didn't want to manipulate the patch multiple times. Uh, so I did not risk uh, to lose the patch with the exchange. But three months post-op, the, um, the, the observation of the anatomy was, as you can see, it was very disappointing uh, with um, uh, atrophic and cystic changes of the patch itself. Anyhow, I decided to move on because I know that other colleagues in the world are trying and they are reporting uh, good results, so I didn't want to give up. This was um, operated for retinal detachment and macular hole, this patient. Uh, well, here you can see uh, three months. Now I am at five months post-op and still the patch looks integrated. The patient have very poor vision, but uh, uh, I think in this patient vision could be compromised also for, uh, for other reasons. So I cannot comment on that, only on the anatomical integration that looks much better than the previous one. Uh, the fifth case is the best one. You can see that you, you can observe the layers, actually, and a good integration of the layers itself with the surrounding retina. Uh, I decided to follow this patient with microperimetry as well. These patients start to show a more central fixation. Um, her vision is now uh, 0.1 and she can read one centimeter uh, letters. So in this table, I summarize the first uh, um, results of this technique applied for chronic macular holes. Um, I, uh, I did not share with my colleagues uh, the, um, the, the, the success that uh, they presented, although I understood that um, as always, improving the technique and improving the selection might, might lead to some results. Uh, some of you know that uh, I have uh, an experience with uh, RPE choroidal transplant for um, uh, exudative maculopathy. Uh, with very encouraging results like this one. This is a patient that I operated a few years ago with uh, just a choroid patch for exudative maculopathy. She can see 0.4. She has a good reading vision, and this is her microperimetry with showing central fixation and a good sensitivity of the retina on the patch. So 
I, uh, this is a case that I would never operate now with a choroidal patch because I understood in the ears that uh, um, a result like this, like the previous one, can be reached only if the retina is not compromised. So this is not a good indication for choroidal transplantation. Uh, but what if we transplant choroid and retina? This was the question. How to perform surgery? Nobody could tell me, as you can imagine. So I perform the usual uh, choroidal patch under the fovea, harvested from the mid-periphery. And then I decided to harvest a, a peripheral patch of retina as well. The literature uh, tell us something. It's been reported that from the very periphery, close to the aura serrata, there are multipotent cells that can be, um, uh, that may become photoreceptors. Uh, for example, uh, after PVR, after uh, inflammatory um, response, as an inflammatory response. So I decided to harvest the peripheral retina. This is the pre-op OCT. And this is how it looks just one week after surgery. It's impressive to see the disappearance of the systoic changes. So the, the, the foveal retina of the patient looks extremely good. This is the patch of retina in the, in the subretinal uh, space. And this is the patch of choroid, which is already revascularized. This is how it looks eight months after. So the anatomy is uh, somehow encouraging, but uh, she has no subjective improvement at all. And uh, she fixates outside the fovea. I, I'm observing that microperimetry is essential in this kind of surgery to understand what we are doing to these patients. Anyhow, I moved on. This is a second patient, very similar to the previous one, pre-op, post-op, still the patch placed in the subretinal space because uh, also uh, formation of extrafoveal synapses are described. So it might make sense. But um, uh, in this case, as you may observe, I had a deep atrophy of the, of the fovea on top of the CNV. So what happened during surgery? During surgery, when I detached the retina, as I, we usually do uh, to perform subretinal surgery, I induced a macular hole. Uh, this is the removal of CNV, the isolation of the choroidal patch. Uh, the patch is transplanted under the fovea. This is RPE and choroid, full thickness. And then you will see that I observe the uh, presence of the macular hole. So I decided to perform surgery, uh, which actually made more sense. I isolated a um, patch of retina from the equatorial area. I flattened the retina and uh, with PFCL on top of the retina, and then I moved uh, the patch um, into the macular hole, as with the technique of uh, Tamer Mahmoud for the macular holes. So how does it look? This is the patch of retina. And this is the patch of choroid. So in this way, the layers are respected. And this is another case very similar to the previous one. This is, this is the patch of retina. As you can see, partly is inside the macular hole, partly on top, but uh, it doesn't seem to, to be significant. And she actually is the first patient there is a showing a real improvement in vision. She refers a scotoma disappearance, 
Her vision is 2200 at six months. It was counting fingers. Her reading ability is improving, but uh, most of all, the fixation seems to be more and more central in, uh, in the follow-up months. So, I, in the end, oh, okay, uh, more um, pictures of OCT and, um, and microperimetry of the, the same patient. And this is the table of the patient I operated with a combined choroid and uh, retinautologous transplant. So the last patients that I operated are showing an improvement in the central fixation and microperimetry as well as in vision. What can I say on this technique? I think it, it's a very, very difficult technique. It's very difficult to manage the retina patch, so probably we are inducing also uh, iatrogenic alteration of the patch that might uh, compromise the result of surgery, so we have to learn how to do it, first of all. Uh, we don't know how to harvest, how to uh, complete surgery. It's a, it's a completely open field. Is it worth doing? Um, well, at this point I can tell you that I think it is because I was very, very disappointed last year with the first result, but in the last months, I must say in the last two months, this is very, very new, uh, I am observing a better integration in the last patient that I operated and a real improvement in visual function so I feel the, the need to move on. Uh, I think it's worth studying and learn how to do it. Thank you. Brilliant technique, thank you. Uh, very encouraging surgeries. Uh, have, uh, have these patients had um, uh, PVR complications or not? Okay, well, mm, not yet. <laughs> But uh, as you have seen from the table, these are very few patients and with a very short follow-up. Um, even with the, uh, with the choroidal patch, I'm collecting all the data because I'm almost ready to, to submit a paper for publication. Uh, with the choroidal patch, I have a 10% um, 10 percent uh, complication of PVR, retinal detachment and PVR. So um, I think it's comparable to usual <coughs> surgery, slightly more, but I think it's worth, it could be acceptable for this kind of surgery. I, um, I expect that this type of surgery might have the same rate of, uh, of retinal detachment. And though the, your previous group uh, with an only choroidal detachment and those in this group, small group, I suppose they, they uh, remain with a silicon oil and the tamponade for a long time. A few months. A few months. Uh, routine is three months. But it might... Uh, so usually in three months you... you I remove the silicon remove. oil. Yeah. And um, with the patch of choroid... I have observed, and this is what I'm publishing, the, um, I have observed that the patient that improve vision, they do improve vision after months. Some of them improve vision after one year. And if they start improving vision, they keep improving. They cannot for, stop. <laughs> they, yeah, well, they keep improving for at least two to three years. The maximum visual acuity that I have observed in these patients is 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 in the best one with a, a gain in reading vision and microperimetry as I'm doing now. So I think um, it makes sense to wait also for this patient with a combined transplant and judge the result after at least one year. A transplantation of any kind of tissue takes time to integrate and show um, and show a result, but none of us would have think that would have thought that the retina might integrate somehow. This is this is the best thing that uh, we are observing with this surgery. Whether or not it will lead to functional results, I think it's very very soon to say. 
Yes, you, you pointed very good uh, point uh, issue that the anatomy of forward centralis is completely different than than we substitute from the periphery. Yeah. So it may yes. play a role in the gaining of vision. Mm -hmm. but thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Parolini, thank you very much for sharing your experience, great experience in that field. I just want to share my experience, if yes. we allow me. I have done just two cases of autologous retinal transplants, and my um, for which indication for unclosed uh, chronic macular holes. holes after few surgeries. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, my experience with perfluorocarbon is similar to yours. So, I decided to do without uh, perfluorocarbon. Oh. I directly uh, did a fluid air exchange and then put silicone oil. And the so how did you keep the patch? With the forceps. By manually? Ah. Yes. Uh, and it worked better than uh, with uh, perfluorocarbon because uh, first time my transplant was uh, attached to, to perfluorocarbon bubble and it moved with the bubble. <laughs> so I decided to move it out. Yes. And uh, the um, second point I uh, want to share is that uh, I tried a little bit to stabilize the transplant with pushing uh, within the edges of the hole. So at least uh, because my cases are uh, not uh, such longer. Uh, I mean, uh, I did, it, uh, did them uh, uh, half a year ago. So anatomically, they look great. I cannot say um, anything about fun functional improvements because... They did not improve. Slightly, maybe from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1. Um, first case and the second case from counting fingers to 0 0.05. Um, but uh, anatomically, they look, for, uh, up to now, they look good. Yeah. Um, one question is uh, for you, maybe you have uh, uh, more experience with that, because I heard uh, some people are doing under gas tamponade. Do you have any experience with that? No, the cases that I operated are under silicon. I had the feeling, or at least I asked myself, whether the PFCL might have induced some kind of toxicity. Uh, I, I thought that looking at the post-op OCT and the changes, especially in the patients that I left under PFCL for one week because I was not able to complete the exchange, it might. We will see by changing the technique whether the, the, the anatomical improvement can be, can be obtained. As far as vision, I can tell you that since I am uh, performing microperimetry, I understood that we can't say anything on vision until we do microperimetry. There are patients, you, you can't imagine where the patient can fixate and have good vision. I have a patient with good sensitivity on the nasal retina, and she has, a na she has developed a nasal point of fixation, is unbelievable. Uh, so, we cannot comment on those results unless we see that the patient can fixate on the patch. That can tell us that the surgery is working, otherwise we can't say anything. More questions? I would like to ask the colleagues if you have questions that maybe you thought now about the previous lectures. So, if we have time, I have uh, a comment and maybe a question for Dr. Zornich for pneumatic retinopexy. I just have a comment uh, on uh, that puncturing a cornea with the needle. I don't do in that way. I do with the MVR blade because it's much better and uh, uh, that wound usually seals and you can do uh, uh, you regulate uh, the pressure as much as you uh, as you can do, but. Uh, my question is uh, uh, whether you can inject always 0.5 cc gas uh, because I noticed in my patient I see then in many times when I inject 0 
I have immediate uh, uh, arterial closure, so whether it is possible always to inject 0.5 cc. That is a good point. Uh, it's not always uh, 0.5. Actually, I uh, start to inject and uh, feel the pressure with my finger and uh, adjust it. But uh, mostly, it's, uh, I get to inject uh, 0.5 in 95% of patients. You said that the, uh, the weakest uh, indications are pseudophagic patients and patients with lesions at 10 and 2. 2 o'clock. What is your feeling about those patients? Why uh, are they not successful? What is the reason? The problem is the uh, maintaining position uh, at 2 at, uh, and 10 o'clock. Actually, you have to lean your head uh, on one side. And uh, as much as we instruct patients and give them information that it's very important to keep that position, I find them uh, in all different kind of positions when I come back to their uh, right. rooms. So, so it's position. What about pseudophagic? Pseudophagic uh, is the problem of the visualization. Uh, most of the, not most, but uh, if you see that uh, pseudophagic eye is not dilating properly, or if you have any kind of uh, peripheral opacities, opacities of the capsula, of the capsula uh, then mm. there is possibility that you miss okay. some break. So it goes to clear uh, absence of clear yes. media, yeah. which might be improved with the endoillumination. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I declare our session closed. I thank you so much for being present. Thank all the speakers for the very interesting talks.